What's up, guys? I'm Garrett Martisano, and this is the MMA Rundown brought to you by FanDuel. We're going to talk about one topic for about three minutes and then move on to the next one. Today, I'm joined by, as always, Chris Holds It Down Holdsworth. Let's go. All right, and first topic up, we've got the iPoke DQ for Benil Muhammad versus Leon Edwards. This just took place last weekend. Leon came in as the minus 265 favorite in this fight. I was really looking forward to Leon getting back in there. Back in the octagon after a long, long layoff. Yeah. He was out since early 2019. Um, had, had a couple fights booked that fell out. And a lot of people anticipated this fight. But Leon was coming off of three weeks uh, his previous fight where he got a great win. Coming in this fight as an underdog. But a lot of people were pulling for Belil in this fight. Unfortunately, it ended with the second round, no contest. Before we get into the to the DQ, what did you think about the fight leading up to the to the eye poke? Man, I thought Leon was looking really good. Um, you know, that southpaw straight left down the middle was landing. He was switching it from the straight to an overhand. He was also throwing that rear kick really well. Uh, I'm a big fan of that rear kick. Anytime you have the opposite stances because it lands to the body and it's just yep. there's more more of the body to be striked compared to the, you know, same same stance. So I thought, you know, he was on his way to victory, in my yeah. opinion. And, you know, it sucks this eye poke happens. It's like, when are these gloves going to be changed? Like, you know, Trevor Whitman talks about it all the You're time. Right. It's like, we need to do something about these MMA gloves and, and somehow fix it because, you know, all these eye pokes that are happening, like, they shouldn't be happening. I 100% agree. And that's a great point bringing that up, Trevor Whitman. It's because these gloves allow you to extend your fingers fully out. And why not have them a little curved? So Trevor's gloves have them to where, like, the most you can go out is like that. And I get it when you're grappling, you still need your hands and flexibility, but you don't need to go straight out. And, and that's what leaves it open for the eye poke. And now we're seeing it happen more and more. People gauging their distance and throwing their hands out there. And now we're seeing it stopping fights because guys are saying, hey, if I can't see my left eye, I feel like a lot of fighters have, they tough it out and they, they fight anyways. Yeah. Now more and more they're thinking, just like we just saw Aljamain Sterling take the knee Belil will take the eye poke. They're saying, hey, this is my record on the line. I'm trying to be a champion. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to continue. So I think they need to do something about it. I know it's a tough thing to do to completely change the glove design. But the UFC could do it. They could put some guys on it and get it done. So this fight ended. Second round, DQ. Belil decided not to continue. No shame on him. At first, I was like, oh, man, you can continue. Get out there. Who am I to say? He's, yeah. he's in the octagon, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, after looking at it too, Dana showed a few close-up picks. It was a pretty nasty eye poke. It cut his eyelid to all where it's bleeding and, and swollen up. So you can't fault him for. for yeah, you right. need to be able to see these shots coming. You know, at at this level of mixed martial arts, you know, one shot can put you in the hospital, bad concussion, bad bad laceration, whatever it is. Like, um, so you got to be able to see. So I can totally understand, you know, him taking the DQ and and not continuing because. You know, even though, you know, we're tough and all that, like we, we got to look out for ourselves, our health, not only our health and the win on the record, but, you know, it's going to be two checks instead of one, too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So now Belil, he's trying to call for the rematch immediately. He wants to get back in there. Uh, so major credit to him. Leon on the other side, he's calling for a title fight. He says, hey, I was winning this fight. I get it's a DQ. Thank you, Belil, for stepping in. But he's trying to look past Belil now and say, I I'm ready for that title bout. So a little bit of a stretch for him to say that. I think he should probably jump back in there and get the rematch. He was dominating that fight. Uh, you know, it was look, looking like most likely he would win. Who knows what would happen in the rematch? Now Belil knows his game plan, sees what's coming in. Yeah. That left kick and that, that left hand was sneaking through. It's like he was laying in it uh, every time he threw it. So we'll see what happens next. DQs are becoming more, more popular in UFC. Like I said, fighters are taking that way out. No shame in it. This is, you know, critical to their health and to their record. They got to think about their career and their future. So we'll see what happens. I hope the rematch gets booked and, and they get back in there and mix it up again. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Again, from UFC Fight Night last weekend is Dan Ige gets the 22-second KO against Gavin Tucker. So this was a wild fight. Uh, you know, I thought it was going to be, a, they were going to mix it up. For a couple rounds and end up being a decision win for Dan Ige. I think we both called decision win for Ige in this fight. Yeah. Uh, so we definitely didn't think it was going to be an early KO, even though we know Dan has that type of power. 
What did you think about that fight and how, how the knockout ended up? Hey, his nickname's 50K for a reason. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he's got a, a lot of good finishes like that where, you know, he, he's won bonuses. That's why his nickname is, you know, 50K. So it didn't surprise me that, he, you know, he got that quick knockout. He, he trains his butt off. He trains with a great team over there at Extreme Couture, you know, around other, uh, other top fighters. So we were training with top guys. You have top coaches. Like, you know, you're just going to rise to the top. Yeah, he trains out there with Extreme Couture. I'm a big fan of that team. All the guys are, you know, top notch. And, you know, I actually know Dan. Dan, personally, we've trained a couple times. So I was rooting for him, you know, the whole time. I'm glad he got that win. Yeah, huge win for him. A lot of people are, are chiming in on Twitter. We actually threw a few up here on the screen. Chris Weidman says, wow, Ige is not playing in there. Justin Gaethje says 50K uh, strikes again. Pay that man his money. Paul Felder says... Dynamite Dan living up to that name tonight. Got to buy them diapers now, Dan. Uh, he just had a kid. That's why Paul is referring to that. Henry Cejudo jumped in. This is why they call me 50K UFC. Give that man money, Dynamite Dan. So huge win for him. Coming in the post-fight interview, you know, just like I mentioned to, to Max Griffin earlier, it's your time to shine. You got these 60 seconds of fame to where you got a bunch of eyeballs watching you. It's your time to make a call out. And he called out the Korean zombie. So he wants to up. book his next yeah. fight. He wants to get right back in there and mix it up. He said he wants to spend some time with his new baby and be home for them. I know it's about six weeks where you want to build that connection as, as a, a new father. So kudos to him. We'll jump in and do that. But that's plenty of time to, to book a fight out three, four months out. You got to think that Korean Zombie, it's been some time since Brian Ortega. He's got to be looking for a fight. So what do you think about that fight, Korean Zombie versus Dan Ige? Yeah, I think that's a great call out. And, you know, going back to Chell Sonnen's book uh, that I read back in the day, like, he had like a whole chapter about like, hey, use that platform after your win to get your next fight or to to sell, you know, to sell something. If you you know, market yourself to where you you have that stage, like do something, you know. What I mean, don't be one of those guys like, and it's hard not to be. I was one of, oh, just give me anybody, you know, like because yeah, yeah. you want to be humble and stuff. But nowadays, people want the entertainment. As you've seen, Conor McGregor makes the most money. Floyd Mayweather makes the most money. And what do they do the best? They talk that. They talk yeah, that crap, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So you got to be able to call people out, make this entertaining for, for the fans, and uh, that was a great call out. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I want to see that fight, definitely. And last thing on this topic, if you guys are wondering, Dan Ige did get performance of the night and got that 50K, 50K bonus. Dan, 50K Ige. All right, now we'll move on to the next topic. This was one I was really happy to see. One of my favorite fighters of all time, Tony Ferguson, got a matchup against Benil Darush. So opening lines is he's coming in as a plus 138 underdog. First time Tony's been an underdog in wow. a while. Darush is coming in as a minus 165, one, minus 166 favorite. Um, so this is pretty crazy. It's booked for May 15th. This is at UFC 262. I'm excited for this one. It's it's a get back on streak for Tony. And it's Darush who's coming off a six fight win streak. And he's just been looking sleek in every one of his fights. Real crisp boxing. He's been putting a lot of guys away. So it's really a tale of two different stories here. And now Darush gets to jump up in the talent pool and, and face a guy that really puts him up there in the top five if he gets a win. So what do you think about this matchup, Chris? This is a great matchup. Uh, you know, Tony's, Tony needs to get a win. Um, you know, Delarouche has been putting these wins together. And uh, I, I know both of these guys. I've trained with Tony in the past. I, I know uh, Benil from the jiu-jitsu scene. Yep. And it was really cool to see him, like, back in the earlier jiu-jitsu scene and then kind of see him transition to MMA. Um, you know, I'm always a big fan of the, like the jiu-jitsu guys who, who yeah. turn, you know, to MMA, but you know, let, let's see if, uh, you know, let's see if Tony can, you know, fix whatever he's been doing, you know, wrong in his previous fights. And it, I don't know if he's switched things up with, with his coaches. I know he kind of likes to do his own thing when it comes yeah. to training. Um, I, he definitely needs to work with some jiu-jitsu guys for this, for this fight, because uh, I know, you know, Delarouche is, is really, really good on the ground. And he's got a lot of knockouts now, too, training with Cordero and the guys at King's MMA. So, man, I'm pumped for this one. Um, he, You know, you got to think he probably saw how Oliveira worked Tony on the ground. Yeah. Um, so Darush might be thinking, hey, maybe my game plan is to take him to the down. We know that Tony has high output on the striking game and on his feet. He can mix it up with combinations, elbows, kicks, and he just doesn't stop. Spinning elbows, spinning back fists, he has a whole arsenal there. And Darush does too. He has great hands, but maybe the game plan should be taking Tony to the ground. Tony, on the other side, Charles Oliveira is one of the most proficient BJJ black belts in all of MMA. So that was really high level. 
So maybe that's one of the one of the only guys that can kind of be a wet blanket to Tony on the ground. One of the only few guys. On the other side, Gaethje, who's one of the best strikers in the game, really outstruck Tony in that fight. So we saw a guy beat Tony by striking. We saw a guy beat Tony on the ground. Maybe it's Tony just needs to get his head right and be in the right space in this fight. But an early prediction, Chris, on this fight, if you were to predict how this fight goes, not till May 15th, uh, what do you think? How's the outcome? I'm, I'm pulling for Benil on this fight. Uh, I think, you know, with his six wins, he, he's riding off a lot of confidence. Uh, you know, I don't really see, you know, Tony doing too much to him standing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, Benil is good enough in his stand-up to negate all that crazy stuff and just stay tight and, and look for the sharp shots down the middle or look for, you know, look, look for those type of type of strikes. And then, uh, I think if it gets to the ground, I think he'll, he'll work Tony on the ground too. So, uh, you know, I'm wow. pulling for, uh, Benil on that one. Wow. That's a big call. I thought you might go Tony. I'm going to go Benil as well. Every time I see him on a card, he's always a fighter that I, I love to watch fight. He's so patient in there. He's got big power in his hands. So I'm going to go Benil. I think Benil gets the TKO finish as of now. We'll see how these lines move as we get closer to the fight. I wonder if Tony is changing camps, coming off two losses, first time in his career, I believe. So this is this is a, a big crossroads for both fighters. Benil breaks into the top five. Tony probably drops out of the top five if he takes another loss. So this is going to be big, really big fight. So we'll see what happens coming up May 15th. All right, let's jump on to the next topic. Some unfortunate news. Marvin Hagler passed away uh, just this past week. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's a big-time boxer, had some big-time matches, and he was always all about the grit of the game. He's in there pumping iron. He's running at 5 in the morning. He's about, you know, he when he, he was asked about his fights, he would say, I'm getting ready for war. And so he really built himself as, like, this gritty gritty type of boxer this is before my era but i thought it was a really cool thing joe rogan shared an illustration he did when he was 15 years old um i believe it was wow. back in 1983 and this was a really cool drawing of, of marvin Hagler. he said he's a, been a huge fan of him his entire life and he kind of spoke to that grit he said marvin used to run on the beach barefoot five in the morning and chant to himself i'm ready i'm ready for war i'm prepared for war and that's some gritty crazy stuff so we're going to start seeing this generation of the old school famous boxing generation that are going to all start passing away. The guys that were competing in the 60s, 70s, 80s, because now they're up there in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so it's hard to see see them go. Were you a fan of Marvin Hagler at all? Did you see this when you saw oh, this? Oh, yeah. News? Oh, yeah. Like like you said, this is before our time. But like if you're a fan of combat sports, you know, you've done your research and yeah. you, you know who you know, the good and best boxers have been in the time. So, you know, Hagler, Hearns, you yeah, know, I just yeah, watched, you know, Eru Hawani post that round the other day. I was yep. like, dude, that was an epic fight. Epic first round. Yeah. Um, yeah, all those old school guys, man, they they it was a different breed back then. Like, you know, they didn't have all the technology that they have now. Uh, like you said, it was all all grit and all toughness, and um, you know they all stuff was done old school ways. You know yeah. now everyone's like all science, nutrition, all this stuff, and like back then they they didn't really know much. There wasn't much uh, text out there or internet videos out there. Like they had their coach, their team, and a lot of guys didn't really you know sway away from that. You know they stayed with those with, with those coaches and teams for the for their whole career. So I admire the the the, the back in the old days and all those guys because I think it was a little bit harder back then. I agree. Def, definitely a harder approach to the game and the grit is all they knew. They had to push through and, and get their body ready. Definitely fortunate in this day and age to have all the technology. But for you, Chris, when you were growing up, let's say on the boxing side and the MMA side, you know, we're going to go through this experience in our life as well. When we get older, since we look up to these guys in a younger age, they're going to pass away. They're going to get older. It's just part of uh, life and how generations uh, grow on, right? Yeah. So when you were growing up, who, who, were your favorite, who was your favorite boxer growing up and who was your favorite MMA guy? Yeah, man, that, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, boxers, it was a few. Like, I don't think I had, like, a favorite. Of course, like, I was always a Muhammad Ali fan. Yep. Um, you know, like, I think when I was a kid, uh, it was Tyson and Holyfield, that whole year, Debasco. Yeah. So, like, uh, I remember I, I jumped on Holy, the Holyfield bandwagon for a bit when he beat Tyson. Nice. And then Lennox Lewis, like... Um, was and then I was, you know, I've, I've always been a fan of Floyd Mayweather and Pacquiao. And, uh, you know, I like De La Hoya's style. 
Yeah. So I, yeah, I, awesome. I, I, I try to pick a little bit of everybody, Roy Jones Jr. Yeah. And there's so many good boxers. It's hard for me to like pick somebody where I was like, man, he was my favorite. Yeah. But I had certain guys that I liked. They did certain things that I really liked. And I would try to look out for those things and try to learn from that. Um, you know, but coming up, my I remember Frank Mir was like my my favorite fighter when I first started because oh, okay. he was like the jujitsu guy. Yeah. And I remember like right when I got on the scene is when he broke Tim Sylvia's arm, Oof. and uh, you know he, he told whole Tank Abbott. And I was like, dude, this guy's submitting everybody in the UFC. Yeah. And I was like, I remember I was ride, riding with Frank Mir for a while there. Oh, I could see that. For me, my dad was a huge Mike Tyson fan, so he threw crazy parties and always for the fights growing up. This is when I was really young. Um, and then from there, I became a huge Roy Jones Jr. fan. <laughs> I love, I played a song over and over. Yeah, and yeah. my best friend at the time, he was even more of a fan of his than I was. And maybe by association, it made me even a bigger fan. And we'd be boxing in a heavy bag in the garage and just listen to that, his, his song and just all of his highlights. We probably listened to, watched his highlight mix over a hundred times. So yeah. we, we were obsessed with Roy Jones. We, we loved, loved Roy. And on the MMA side, Really, I got to say Chuck Liddell was a big guy who really... He was one of my favorites too, but... It's hard to yeah, pick. There, yeah, there's so yeah. many of them. Um, Chuck Liddell, his celebrations, his antics, his beef with Tito Ortiz. Yeah, yeah. I grew to hate Tito Ortiz for a while because I was on the Chuck Liddell side. Shamrock, the whole drama of all of it. So I would say it was Chuck Liddell who really I first became a super fan of and Roy Jones on the boxing side only led me to like both sports uh, more and more. All right, let's jump on to the next topic. Next up, this was interesting. We got Marcio Rojo. I might be butchering that name. He's a new UFC fighter. He's coming in the UFC. It was his first fight. So he kind of has this celebration where he he looks like he's a velociraptor <laughs> and he runs yeah. around the ring after he gets a win. So I've seen this. Here he is running around. And... Unfortunately for him, you know, he got some press on this. We're, we're, we're going to be excited to see it. But he actually took some heavy, heavy body shots and ended up losing via body shot. TKO could not continue. Um, so it was a tough fight for him. You know, he's going to get right back in there. He fought his, his butt off. So I, I see him staying around and getting another fight for sure. But the topic I wanted to bring up is celebrations within the UFC. And so we have him. In the MLB, after you hit a home run, when you're scoring a touchdown in the NFL, you know, they, they have these crazy antics and celebrations, and they've had to tone them down in the NFL. And you do have it in the UFC as well. Some of the notable ones are Tito Ortiz, who buries his opponent after he got a win. I like Derek Lewis. You know, he gets down on the ground, he kind of looks up with his crazy face, and he wiggles his tongue out of his, his head. That just looks some kind of psycho move. And then you got the guys like Michael Chandler and Justin Gaethje who jump up on the side of the octagon and do a backflip off. That is yeah, pretty wild. Crazy. So what do you think about celebrations in, in the UFC? I mean, you don't want these guys to get hurt, but uh, do you like the kind of antics after you get a win? Do you think it's a little different than football to where, oh, you scored and maybe outran your opponent? In the MMA, you might be coming off a, a knockout or submission win. It could be thought of as disrespect. What, what do you think about it? Yeah, there's a fine line. Um, you know, if it's like your thing and you know, sometimes you just can't you can't help yourself. If like you've never been in a fight, especially a high level UFC fight and you win, you don't understand what kind of adrenaline's pumping through your body at that time. Like I've told people before, like winning a fight or just winning a UFC fight especially is like probably the best drug. You know, yeah, like the yeah. feeling, you know, the feeling of of winning and um uh, so I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't blame some of these guys after a big knockout or something like you're just so pumped and juiced. Like yeah. you can't do anything. You know, you all, you probably want to, uh, run out of there and like go hug, you know, hug somebody, but all you can do is jump off the cage or do some, you know, do some flashy, uh, weird dance or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was never big into the, the thing, maybe just raise my hand and, and, and do that and kind of run around the cage. I was going to ask you, I saw one of yours when you got to win, you kind of ran around the cage and you just threw <laughs> up the number one, number one, one of your ultimate fighter wins. I was going to ask you, was, yeah. was that kind of your celebration? You got the win, you just kind of run around. Throw no, up and I remember, uh, that I, I had like the number one, <laughs> I had the fist <laughs> yeah. and then I had just like the flex. Like if they were talking, they're talking crap, I would flex on them like afterwards. Um, yeah. and then one time I busted out the Hawaiian Campo salute. What is that? Uh, it's, 
You would have the, it's on one of my fights on the Ultimate Fighter, okay. but uh, I busted that out just because I was like, I'm gonna do the Hawaiian Kempo salute if I win. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but now I look back at it, I'm like, oh man, I was probably a little douchey, but whatever. <laughs> no, it's all good. I, I like the celebration, especially if they're it seems like yours are a little bit more respectful. You know, Derek Lewis does his move, and it's like right as the guy is unconscious on the ground, yeah. he's three feet away from him. Jacare Souza also has a good one. You know, he's the alligator. The alligator. Well, the reason I like Jacare is because he's been doing that for a year. He did that in jiu-jitsu. Oh, really? So it's not like he just made this up and he's doing it all of a sudden. Like, he's been doing that for years, so I respect that. Yeah, yeah. Chuck Liddell had a good one, too. A lot of good ones. We'll see. I think, you know, it's a it's a little iffy on, on the KOs and TKOs when the opponent's unconscious on the ground, but... It's part of the entertainment of the sport. You got people watching from around the world. You got people there watching live. It is an entertainment game at the end of the day. So they're fun to watch. Just yeah. don't get hurt because the Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler, those are wild bad Yeah, ones. I would definitely get hurt doing that. So we'll see what happens. All right, that'll be it. That is the MMA Rundown brought to you by FanDuel. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, guys. We appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time.